to go against the role that God has given her to be submissive to her husband. And so I think it's and so I think that's why it's of of course it's all, it's important for all of us to fulfill the role that God has given us. But the, it seems like it's even more important for women because it says the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit is in the sight of God of great price. And it's just something especially when you look at the world. The world has moved women away from their role. I, I mean, to, to even to suggest wives submit unto your husbands as unto the Lord. Uh, in most cultures today would be considered verbal abuse of women. It would be just such a, it's just such a bad thing. They would, they would, they would, they would ban you. They wouldn't let you say it. They wouldn't have anything to do with you. They would boo, they'd try to get rid of you. And all you're doing is quoting scripture. But it's so against this culture. And so that's why I think it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that Jesus compares believing Israel to a pearl of great price. And he compares women who fulfill their role of an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit of great price. I think there's a, there's a correlation there. So, You know, you, you spoke of Lana. You used to say that, or you've said in the past, that she adorned the doctrine. And um, as we've been studying on Thursdays about the role of women, we're in that place in 1 Corinthians 11 where it talks about that, and Paul, where, where Shay mentioned head covering and all of that's in there about that. But the lasting ordinance, Paul says, keep the ordinances as I have delivered them to you. And that's in 1 Corinthians 11 too. And then in verse 3 he says, but I would have you know this. I think I've got the verses right. I don't know. but uh, And then he gives the order. He gives the headship order. The head of every man is Christ, but the head of the woman is the man. The, the head of Christ is God. And to me, that when, when you as a woman can learn what that means and you can adorn that doctrine, and in love, respect your husband and be submissive to him in that way, as unto the Lord. That is adorning the doctrine as a woman. And to today, the headship has just been annihilated in the church because women speak over men. You you have especially in charismatic circles, yeah. you have women stepping up, speaking in tongues, women doing all of this stuff that's not even prevalent today. But the women have stepped up into that role. So yes, the, the, the women have, society has pushed women to not understand her role, her God-given role, but it's also pushed men to not understand his role. And I'm gonna say this, Eric, because for me, to watch you, and I never got to meet Lana face to face, but I got to meet her by her voice on, on these calls, on these studies. But you stood up to your role as a man to teach her the doctrine of the Word of God. And that's why she could adorn the doctrine, because you were the man you were supposed to be to her. And so I think that men and women both alike need to examine what is my role? What is my God-given role? It's not about God's will for me. We know what God's will is, <laughs> that yeah. every man be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. But it's about how can I fulfill my role as a woman? How can I fulfill my role as a man? And it is to adorn the doctrine for me as a woman and for you as a man. And so when we saw your life with Lana and those of us who only saw it online, you adorned that as well. And so she was able to adorn the doctrine as you were able to teach it to her. And, and I respect that so much and that example. So I just want to say that because it is watching that, sitting here under you, hearing these wonderful comments and questions it has helped me to understand my role 
as a woman, and it has helped me especially understand what that meek and quiet spirit is, because I didn't always have that. I was pretty outspoken myself, uh, and so, and not in a good way. We can be outspoken in, in godliness, but um, we still need to respect our role and fulfill it. So, yes, thank you so, so much. Excellent. I appreciate that, Karen. And yeah, that's why the roles are so important. If you have a man and a woman, both uh, Bible believers and letting Christ live in them, then they'll fulfill those roles. And you can't, uh, that's an example, you can't beat in this world anyway. So th thank you, Karen. I, I appreciate that. I'm humbled by that. Uh, Danya, did you have something? Yeah, I'm sorry. I hope you're not tired of me. My question would be, does some of this that's happening today, as Karen just, just mentioned about men and women, going back to Adam allowing Eve to tempt him, instead of being, you know, the, the headship there, um, I, that's the question, but then I have part two, which is, Please pray meekness and quietness for me. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Yeah, it goes back to that. I mean, both Adam and Eve failed in their roles. Um, even before then, uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy 2 that the reason that Adam is the head, or the man is the head of the woman, was Adam was first formed and then Eve. The commandment was given to Adam. It was his responsibility to follow it. It, Eve can make your input, and that's fine, but uh, Eve should not have been listening to the serpent. She should not have tried to usurp authority over her husband and get him to eat of that fruit. But at the same time, Adam failed in his role by not saying, I am making the decision for both of us that we are not going to eat of that fruit. So, yeah, bo both right. of them failed in that. Yes. Right. And that was passed down, right? That's why it's still happening and getting worse. Well, as a result, we have the sin nature. And so, yeah, then the curse of sin is there. So, yeah, we, uh, yeah, the, the man, uh, the, the woman tries to rule over the man. And the man will eventually, if the woman keeps doing it, will eventually not fulfill his role. And a lot of times the men won't even fulfill their role in the first place. Um, yeah. So And so sometimes the women rise up and lead over the man because... Uh, the man won't fulfill his role as the leader. So, yeah, you, you yeah. still got that. It's all in the sin nature, and it just it's continued for the last 6,000 years. And until we get rid of the sin nature, it'll continue, uh, you know. So. Yeah, it just helps me to, to know where it can, but do play, pray of mercy and quietness for me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Donya. That's a good spiritual prayer. Yeah, keep Donya in your prayers for a meek and quiet spirit. That's a... Uh, that's in the sight of God a great price, and it is a tough, it is a tough, tough thing. You know, Jesus says, <laughs> it doesn't mean, my mouth, my mouth. <laughs> no, it doesn't mean you're a pushover. You know, sometimes people think of that. Jesus says, I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. If you've got that meek and quiet spirit, then you're at rest. But at the same time, Jesus didn't back down from the truth. I mean, he overturned the, the tables of the money changers. So uh, meekness doesn't mean you're a pushover. It just means that you are, you're humble. You don't try to usurp your authority. You don't try to go uh, over your role. And you just try to let Christ live in you and not exalt the flesh and be prideful. So. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Danya. James, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, um... Yeah, just real quick, earlier you were talking about, well, someone, somebody was talking about the, uh, when you were talking about when those that were predicting, you know, President Trump going to be in office again. Um, oh, yeah. I remember seeing a lot of that on, on YouTube. There was that, that lady with the, uh, the pink hair, and then that Pastor Khan, and then, <laughs> oh, there was another, they were just, they were just continually, you know, Saying all oh, you know, all in God's name, all in you know, glory of God, you know, declaring that they were declaring they were prophets, and then the one guy was even saying, um, "Oh yeah, I've had a vision of me walking, you know, walk, seeing me walking through the White House, walking in the Oval Office." And 
know, and I still remember it. I'm just like, yeah, you mean you took a tour of the White House, which is available to the public? Yeah. And <laughs> I'm just claiming that as, as, as a pro- prophetic dream. And I'm like, how do you make this stuff up? And and then the the woman with the pink hair, I, I just, man, I tell you what, very radical. <laughs> well, anyway, the common thing about all this is when, you know, when what happened at the election and, and Trump is not in office, one common thing I've seen since is you don't see hide or hair of those people. I, I have not seen them on YouTube since. Yeah. Or anything. they don't, you know, <laughs> so it's like, Wait a minute! I thought you guys were prophets. Uh, what's going on? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's one common thing I see about these people. They make these predictions, and then all of a sudden they're like, "Whoops, that didn't work out." And then you just then you then they disappear. Mm-hmm. Um, it may have been stolen. Just wanted to touch on it, but um, but the uh, the next thing was uh, I wanted to ask you. Uh, I know they have the terms. Uh, and uh, uh, you were breaking up, James. Could you repeat that? Yeah, yeah. I was just touching on the on that. But the uh, the next thing I had real quick was um, I know you have uh, pastors, but you have the role the other term bishop and deacons. Um, um, I, I I guess I've never asked about this before. But are bishops and deacons are they supposed to be kind of the same thing as pastors and are they for today, or or is that just a, another thing of Paul's sign? And then uh, one last thing was I, I had something real quick for, for Brother Jerry. Um, a while back we were I, we were talking about some Jehovah's Witness stuff on the study, and, and Jerry had mentioned that he had saved some doctrine that the Jehovah's Witnesses had put out like in the mid-1970s and then it was stuff that didn't come true and then he said he would save that. I, I was wondering if he might be willing to maybe make some copies of that and maybe somehow I could kind of get it. So in case I could talk to Jehovah's Witnesses again ever, if they come to my door then I'm going to show them that and see what they have to say about it. But, um, Anyway, that was that was it. Jerry, did you want to respond to that? You call me, Jerry. Yeah, yeah. Did you hear what James said? I did. It was kind of breaking up. He he was saying there's some material from the mid '70s that you had on the Jehovah Witnesses. He was wanting to see if he can get a copy of that. Yes, I'll make a bigger note. How it's supposed to send it. Me too. Okay. Yeah, I have a I have a good bit of it. Uh, I know Jane and I talked about this some time ago. But that's one of my gifts. I failed to do I fail to follow up. That was a joke. <laughs> I guess Jerry, if you will uh I guess if you can get the copy to Lisa, and maybe she can pass it on to Donya and uh, and uh, James as well. I have a briefcase full of it, uh, and uh, anyway, I'm gonna make a big effort to do that support. All right, all right, sounds good. Um, let me uh, address also what you said, James, about the uh, pastors and bishops and deacons. Uh, basically, the pastor. You can see that term in Jeremiah 23, the term pastor, and it's in reference to, that's a term really for, um, you see in Jeremiah 23, uh, verse 1, Jeremiah 23, verse 1, uh, God says through Jeremiah, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. So a pastor, basically the term pastor and maybe I should, maybe I'll write it up on the board. Maybe that'll make it easier. But the term, oh, let's see, it's the term pastor. You can think of a pastor based upon uh, Jeremiah 23, 1. 
You can think of a pastor as a shepherd. Shepherd. Spiritually speaking. And so in Israel's program, you know, they're called the little flock, the believers. Uh, they go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Isaiah 53 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Uh, many times uh, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. Uh, in Israel's program, they are considered spiritually to be immature due to their unbelief. And so the leaders in Israel's program then are called pastors. Then when you get to Paul uh, in Acts 20, when he's talking to the Ephesians, he talks about uh, the pastors there. Then he's got the Ephesians chapter 4, mentions pastors. And so the term, and that's used because although we are adult sons of God, we still don't have all the complete sound doctrine uh, until uh, all of Paul's epistles are written down. So the pastor uh, for today, a pastor uh, body of Christ, was a temporary, that's temporary title until Paul's epistles are completed. Paul's epistles completed. Then today, you get to the titles he gives in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy written toward the end. So all of uh, his epistles, what, Romans through 2 Thessalonians, are all written by that point. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 3, um, he says in verse 1, he talks about bishops. He says, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And he is called in uh, verse... 4, 1 Timothy 3, 4, He is to be one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he care of the church? How shall he take care of the church of God? So today, the role today is a bishop. And that is basically based on 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. That is basically an overseer of the church. So I, I like to think of it in terms of like a teacher. You know, a teacher has the kids. And yeah, the teacher is teaching the kids to uh, math or English or reading or whatever it is. But the teacher is also looking at everything. You know, don't talk in the class. Don't, uh, don't throw air paper airplanes. Uh, you know, don't, uh, don't curse. Don't chew gum in class, you know, all the stuff that they're looking at, all the moral stuff as well. Uh, then when you get to, my, let's say, my job as an adult, um, yeah, I got rules. I mean, I can't, I got to wear business attire. I'm probably, if I was cursing a lot, I, they would reprimand me for that. I mean, there are things like that. But you're not really, they don't really look at that stuff. Mainly, you know, the job description for my job is, well, he's got to have a degree in accounting. He's got to have so many years of experience. Uh, he's got to have, uh, you know, for me, training and accounts payable. You know, they're looking at more of the, the, to use a spiritual term, a doctrine type thing. You're looking at what you know as opposed to how you behave. And so that's how a bishop is. And when you, when you get to the point where you've got all the doctrine down here in Romans through Philemon, you don't have to treat them like a pastor over the sheep, like a shepherd. You know, a sheep, pretty dumb. They can go, you can have a fence, they'll try to get around the fence. Or they don't know where they're supposed to go. They get lost pretty easily. Um, they can, they have a lot of ailments, you know, different things that happen to them. Uh, but today, since we have the maturity of having the sound doctrine of Romans through Philemon, we don't need a pastor anymore. We need an overseer. Just like I don't need a teacher to make sure I don't chew gum in class. I need somebody who is, I've got a boss at work, but that's an overseer. I mean, my boss isn't looking in every detail I do. It's, I've got job duties, and uh, as long as there's no problems reported or she can't see anything that's causing an issue, she's never going to bring anything up. She's not going to tell me what to do because I already know what to do, and I'm doing a good job. So the bishop, uh, as, as the term today, not a pastor, and it's an overseer of the church. You see it in Ephesians 4 and uh, Acts 20, the term pastor used, but that's because they're considered, you don't have all the doctrine. Once you got all the doctrine, 
Now that term goes away. So the bishop is the overseer. Now the deacon is mentioned in starting in verse 8. And the qualifications of the deacon, it says, 1 Timothy 3, 8, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, <coughs> not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Uh, and then it gives you... the If you read the qualifications of a bishop versus the qualification of a deacon, they're very similar. So what I see is like a deacon, I would see that as like a, a bishop in training, you want, you want to say. Because the bishop... Um, the bishop is an overseer, and he said uh, in verse 6, 1 Timothy 3, 6, the bishop is not a novice. He's got to have the doctrine in him, but it's not just the doctrine. He's also got to have charity. He's got to apply it. Uh, the deacon needs to have the doctrine as well, but it's like, so you maybe the deacon, and it depends. A lot of times in these right division churches, we don't have enough people to be a deacon. You, know, you don't have those offices because we're not big enough. But if you did, you'd have somebody basically who would um, fill in for the bishop to teach when the bishop isn't able to teach. Uh, maybe that you've got somebody who is like, like what Richard Jordan has. I mean, I would consider it. I, mean, I don't think he uses these titles, but I would consider Richard Jordan to be the bishop of the Shorewood Bible Church and Alex Kurz to be the deacon. Um, Alex is doing pretty much the same thing. He's teaching on... Uh, the first hour, then Richard teaches the second hour, but uh, it's sort of, that's why I say it's sort of like a bishop in training, because the qualifications are very similar, but he's not, Alex isn't the overseer of the church like Richard Jordan is. So I see that the deacons and bishops are very similar, but it's like the deacon doesn't have all the experience and the, and the doctrine as well as the one who's the bishop. So that that's really so they're very similar, but that's how I would see it. Does that does that help, James? Oh yeah, very much so. Okay. And then um, and then elders. That's nothing but a uh, well. That's a Mormon system, but that's not the elders are not scriptural, right? Well, no. The, the term elder is used. First Timothy five verse one. Paul says, "Rebuke not an elder." but entreat him okay. as a father. Verse 2 mentions the elder women. Uh, okay, but is that, does that imply like, like more senior citizen type, but, but it's not a, a teacher position, or is it an elder meaning like a more a senior citizen type position? Yes, I think it doesn't seem to be an official... Uh, and, so I'm going to have to mute you, James, just because there's a lot of background noise. Um, but... It seems like the elder isn't an official position because you don't really see um, mentioning qualifications for an elder. Um, I, I think it's more like the elder is more like it's like you say a senior position. It's somebody who, not really an overseer, doesn't have these qualifications, but it's just somebody who saw. I mentioned like Richard Jordan would be the bishop, Alex Kurz would be a deacon. If you had somebody who's in the church for let's say thirty years and has got the doctrine and helps out whenever he can, but he's not really an official leader, you'd consider him to be an elder. It's just somebody who's been around a long time, who's known the doctrine a lot, and you see him as a mature, and women as well, elder. You've got elder women here too. So it's just somebody who is uh, more mature in it. You know, like you say, senior. Like if I want to get advice from somebody, you know, maybe I want to go to somebody who is... Uh, been around like if I'm gonna get advice career advice from somebody let's say in my profession I probably go to somebody who not only has a higher position than me but also has a lot more years experience so I get they're an elder in terms of they know more they've been around a long time this isn't their first rodeo they know what's going on so they have some wisdom just from the years of that so that's what an elder is I don't think it's really an official position um, it's just somebody who He's got the doctrine, who's been in it for years, has gone through a lot, who's seen a lot of things happen, attacks of Satan, how he goes against right division, how he goes against the spiritual, and knows the Satan's devices because he's got a lot of experience, and, and the women as well, and they can help both the women and the men, uh, whatever 
it's somebody you go to and ask advice, you know. They've been around a while. They know this, so maybe they can help me. So that's what I'd see an elder as. Uh, oh, helps. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Yeah, the Mormon Church, of course, and all these churches, they've got... Uh, They've got different meanings to those things. I mean, and the you know uh, the Mormons, uh, it's the the missionaries or the elders. I mean, it's hard for me. You know, they got their little badge, and this is Elder Jones. Well, he's eighteen years old. How is he an elder? You know, <laughs> but so they, they they have a different use of elder. But that's how I would see it. The biblical uh, use of that. Yeah. Uh, before I go to Jerry, does anybody else have anything? Go ahead, Lisa. Um, I just I just wanted to say that that my infirmities are not so much physical but mental, and the thinking that has plagued me most of my life. And uh, yes. So and the thing that's changed me and my thinking is reading God's Word, and it's still changing me. And plus, talking to other members of the body of Christ and being vulnerable. And and I praise God for the members of the body of Christ who hear me and. Don't judge me, and my husband who builds me up and points me to Christ always, and always lets me share these mental thoughts that are not of God, and they're my flesh, which hates me. And so um, I just, when I get to that, I've read that scripture in 2 Corinthians 12 over and over and over about Paul glorying in his infirmities. And there's been times when I've been so deep in that negative thinking that's not of God, I just say, Lord, I glory in this, because that's what Paul did. And so I just wanted to give that, but, but the biggest change for me, and I praise God, is reading Romans through Philemon over and over, is changing my thinking by reading it, getting it in my inner man. So I guess I could say the struggles are getting less and less. They're still there. I'm going to be honest, but they're, they are getting less. And um, I thank God for his spirit, his life. I thank God for you. Eric, the teachings that bring life to us from the Word. So I just want to give that brief testimony that God's not done. He's still working, and uh, I thank God for His Word. I thank God for you, Eric. And for How's the body Scotty? of Christ. How's Scotty doing? She's, she, as of yesterday, she was doing better. Okay, because I think she was on the other day, but not today. Yep, she, like yesterday she was doing better, praise God. The iron was helping her, yes. Thank you, thank you. Th thanks for that, Lisa. Um, yeah, um, all of us have mental infirmities that we're, you know, we're not perfect. We're all growing in the doctrine. Uh, regarding what you said in 2 Corinthians 12, when he talks about glorying in infirmities, I think that is a reference to physical infirmities just because of the context. Okay. Uh, you know, he's mentioning... Um, the, Chapter 11, verse 24, down, all the way down through verse uh, 29, I guess, all the physical things he faced. And so then he talks about the thorn in his flesh, chapter 12, verse 7. And he besought the Lord to get rid of that thorn in the flesh. And so when he says he's glorying in his infirmities, I think it's just, it's the, it's the physical things. Uh, but, okay. but you're right, we do have mental infirmities, and I think the mental ones are more like Romans 8, 26. In Romans 8, 26, where it says, The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. And then there's a colon. So the colon after infirmities tells you what the infirmities are. He says, For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So there is your mental infirmities. Is, I don't know what I should pray for as we ought. And praying has to do with Ephesians 6, 17, and 18. I take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication. So God's plan is, we read God's word, we believe what it says, and then pray. Then we pray it. We think it over in our minds. We talk it over with God. And then we use the mind of Christ rather than following our flesh. And so the mental infirmity is we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. Why? Well, because we haven't read the scripture and gotten that doctrine in the inner man. And so like you say, your infirmities are getting better mentally as you read God's word. And so, yeah, that's what... We don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but then you get to Ephesians, and he does know what to pray. So he's got that sound doctrine in the inner man to a greater extent. So yeah, I think there is a difference. Um, yeah, I mean, he the glory in his infirmities, I think, is the physical infirmities, and he sees how that's making Christ strong in him uh, by being weak in the flesh. 
but the, the mental infirmities, then we combat that by reading uh, God's Word. And I can tell you personally, and I think everybody else on here will agree, that I can see a great improvement in you and everybody, really, in the last three years as we've studied God's Word together. Myself and everybody else. Um, just the, the way, I mean, I could tell the way you talk and interact with me, you know, when I talk with you on the phone. I could tell Christ is in you to a greater extent. Not that Christ wasn't living in you before, but just to a greater extent because you've got more of God's Word in the inner man. You've been reading it more, you're studying it, you're growing, you're maturing, and so the mental infirmities get less. And that's, that's what it's all about here, why we're doing this three times a week is to overcome those mental infirmities. And it's... Uh, God's Word effectually worketh in those that believe. So I appreciate you sharing that, being willing to share that, um, and uh, because it's true for all of us, I think. So, so thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. And there, just so I make sure I understand, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, the thorn in the flesh, that flesh is physical then. We need to read that as a physical flesh, not the flesh, sinful nature flesh. Yes, that's what I see it as. It's something that, that was as a physical ailment. Okay. Yeah. And God would not take it away because the physical element led to him trusting in the Spirit more. Okay. So he glories in physical infirmities for Christ's sake. And, and that's another thing. I mean, if you just ran, you know, randomly get cancer, let's say, you don't, you're not glorying that you have that. It's, bec it's just something that happens as a result of for Christ's sake. He glories in those infirmities because then the power of Christ rests on you. Then you trust in Christ being strong through you. So the, yeah, that's a physical infirmity. But the mental infirmity would be the Romans 8.26. Because that's the infirmity of, I don't know what to pray for as I ought, because I don't have the doctrine in my inner man. So, so yeah, there's both mental and physical there. So, Very good. Yeah, thanks Lisa for sharing. Uh, anybody else before we close with Jerry? Okay, Jerry, you want to wrap us up here? Yes, thank you, everyone. That was uh, great, great conversation since the, uh, with everyone. Uh, something I hope that encourages you guys, that I was encouraged by, uh, when I looked into men were teaching about there's a book on earth, the Bible, that's completed as I was coming into right divisions and had many different Bibles on my on book games, I began to hear them teach sound doctrine about how you come to conclusions that there is a book you can hold on your hand and it's equal to God. That was born to me. Uh, I said on the teacher that said you could use the King James Bibles and not if he did, this person did. We said, go ahead and put the uh, Amplified Bible next to it. And I did. So anyway, that's what happens. Then I met people like yourself and Wright Dividers, uh, uh, different uh, teachers over the years, and took a stand on the completed Word of God in the King James Bible and began to look into that a good bit. But I'll show you what things that frustrated me on the way because it wasn't, it did uh, answer my questions such as in... Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verses uh, 8 and 9, it says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. This was Shay and, and David were going to talk about the guy down there teaching and controlling people that were, that were ignorant of the book, as I was. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. And they would explain to me that that which is in part and which is to come was a completed Bible. Well, that didn't answer my question. It was not broad enough, not in depth. But more was coming, I didn't know it. And they continued to teach. But I, I couldn't see what they see in that couple of verses because of my years and years of having different Bibles. So I just continued listening, studying, listening, studying. And then uh, they would bring up Ephesians 4, that you were dead a while ago. 
11 and 12, and that word perfect comes up again in perfection, as it did in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and 9, you find the word perfect. In Ephesians 4, verse 4, and he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some prophets, and some kings, for the perfecting of the saints, again perfected, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And they were getting teaching about how the, in the great fivefold ministry, the fivefold ministry that's, that goes out through uh, churchianity, and, and people carry it on today, and stay true, uh, packed with the uh, Fivefold ministry. So I had to go through that, read that out with these men, and I stayed with them. And they made a point that the apostles were not for today. When you ride up and down the road, you see the apostolic churches or whatever, as uh, David mentioned, in, in, in New Orleans and other cities. So I continued looking, and the word perfect was in there. And then it's in 2 Timothy. Three. Y'all all know where this is at. 16 and 17, we find the word perfect again in the form of um, this teaching. Verse 16 of 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, the early furnace unto all good works. My encouragement in going through this, which all the, the word perfect came up, it took, I started digging in with uh, Short Way Bible Church Fellowship back in 2010. And it took reading and studying, reading and studying, and then I caught it. The work of God caught me. And I caught it. That there was a book I could hold in my hand, and it was equal with God. And that was tremendous. Because now, when they would teach and show me in the Bible that the apostle ministry was over, it must be over, it has to be over, due to the completed book. When, when uh, Ephesians was written, 411 that we know it as of today, Ephesians chapter 411, Paul was still had to write his finished epistles. Also known as the church of the uh, preacher's epistles, the church epistles, one or two Timothy Titus and five Amen. And when they began to show me how that was put together, how God re-correlated the Bible and took the Hebrew Bible, a book now called the Bible, and took those 24 books and recorrelated them by men inspired by the Holy Spirit and made of 39 books. Then you had 27 uh, books in the new, what we call the New Testament. And how he put this book together, and I by faith believe that God spoke the inspired word. He breathed, he spoke the inspired word to these men. They wrote it down perfectly. And when they wrote it down perfectly, God was quite capable of preserving it through the centuries in the midst of a warfare with his arch enemy trying to destroy it. And he has kept it together in the King James Bible. And that took these uh, some years to, to gain confidence in that. And I stand on that now. So I can see why there's no need for apostles because we have a completed book. They didn't have it. When Paul went to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, wherever he went and he left, they were there that men had the gift of apostleship that God knew. They didn't even know it. Just like Eric has a gift of teaching and he does. Uh, these men had the inner man ability for God to work with that when Paul left, they could recall by the power of the Holy Spirit, everything that Paul said, and continue teaching it, and carrying it on in the midst of a battle, because God knew the subversions were coming when Paul left, and they were coming to undermine what he taught 
Now he's gone. And when he left, they had ten men that could stand on the word of God that Paul gave them, and they were apostles. But once the book was completed, all the letters were locked in and done. There was no need for them any longer. So therefore, if the uh, office of the apostles is over, due to the fact that God has completed the book, and they're not needed any longer. But the other, some of those other teachings in Ephesians 4, 11 are. That was my little testimony of what caused me to see that. And when I ride up and down the road and see an uh, apostolic church, I said, well, that person must be over 2,000 years old in there. <laughs> so, anyway, that's, I wanted to share that with you guys. Really enjoyed the uh, whole teaching and Q&A today. It's going to help a lot of people out there. Thank you all. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, thank you for sharing that testimony. Yeah, just to summarize, we don't use the King James because it's the best version. It's not a version issue, it's an authority issue. We know it's God's completed word without error, so we can entrust it and it, it becomes our authority. God has magnified his word above all his name, and we've got his word here in a King James Bible. So once that was completed with all of the uh, scriptures of Paul, then that's the scriptures you mentioned there about the perfect. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 10, when that which is perfect is come. Those gifts, Ephesians 4, 13, go away when you've got the perfect man. And when you've got God's completed word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that the man of God may be perfect. So when you have the authority of the Bible that will bring you to be that perfect man as you read and believe God's word, then you don't need the authority of an apostle to follow that person. You follow God's word. You, you know, it's, it's great. You think of God. I mean, there's no higher name in, in anywhere than God's name. That's the highest one. And yet God says in Psalm 138 too that he has magnified his word above all his name. So God has taken his name and magnified it even above his name, which is higher than anything else. So then why would we take a man and call him an apostle and make him the authority when we've got God's word, when God has already said my word is my authority. So why would we then go back down to earth and have somebody named as apostle? So yeah, that was a great summary, Jerry. I appreciate that sharing your testimony. And you're right, it's something that takes time. I know I've shared that with people, 1 Corinthians 13, and try to show that that, well, that's shown when God's word is completed. You tell a Pentecostal person that, they'll say, oh, no, no, that's not what it means. It means when we go to see Jesus. And, but if you, if you read and you get those and you're looking for the truth and you link those verses together, you can see that. And then when you see that the God's word in the King James Bible is your authority, rather than just the best version, it's actually the authority. It's the word of God magnified above all his name. Then you can see, well, why do I need an apostle with greater authority than an average Christian? Because I've got God's word. That is my authority, because God says it is. So I appreciate that, Jerry. Thanks for sharing your testimony. Yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, wish everybody a good night, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Hey, good night, everybody. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. God bless.